This video is about husbands understand and honor your wives. Hi, I'm Bay Gaddafi and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of 1 Peter in the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll begin in just a moment. First Peter is the book we're studying. This is lesson number 18, and we're starting with chapter 3 and verse 5. If you'd like to open your Bible there, that's where we'll begin. Actually, we're going to get the context of verse 5 through 7 by starting with verse 1 of chapter 3. It says there, Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that is, a hus the husband is not being obedient to the word or is not a believer, they also may without the word, in other words, not under the influence of it, be won by the conversation or the way that the wife lives of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or your pure manner of life, coupled with fear, whose adorning of the wife, that's the outward appearance of her, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair or braiding, of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. So God is interested on what the wife looks like on the inside, not so much the outside. It's what the in, is what's inside is going to be able to win her husband to the Lord. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. So that lasts forever what you are on the inside. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then our verse begins with uh, chapter 3 and verse 5. For after this manner, in other words, what he's just described in 1 through 4, how a woman is supposed to be, in the Old Time, that is in the Old Testament, holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. So he's going to give us examples of how women did this and how it worked. Being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah, that is uh, Abraham's wife, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, in other words, you're following along in the same steps that she took, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Verse 7, likewise you husbands dwell with them, in other words, with your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife, even as unto a weaker vessel, and being heirs to, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these instructions you've given to husbands and to wives and how we're supposed to live together, how we're supposed to interact, what each relationship for each of us is supposed to be like. Lord, help us to understand the example of Sarah and how she was a godly woman, a holy woman, and how women are to imitate her and how husbands are to treat their wives. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit has inspired this, that Peter has written it, that it comes from you, that we can base our lives upon it and not be disappointed or be ashamed. Lord, help us not to be fearful with any fear, that when we do this, it will work, and you will make it work. Lord, we thank you for the grace you've bestowed on us through the Lord Jesus. Ask for your Holy Spirit now, Lord. Teach us by him. Open our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 5. How do holy women submit to their husbands? So verse 5 says, For after this manner in the old time, holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Here's an example given to us by the Apostle Peter of just what he's told us in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, about how a woman is supposed to behave toward her husband, in subjection to him. If he's unsaved, it, it, will, it will aid him in his uh, progress toward the Lord, progress toward salvation. 
her, her, her pure manner of life, the way that she lives, it's going to be an aid to any husband. Uh, if he's following the Lord and she behaves this way or if he's not following the Lord. This is the character that she's supposed to have. Subjection to your own husbands. And he uses the Old Testament after as an example. After this manner in the Old Testament. When we're tempted to say, really? Do you think this is going to work? Verses 1 through 4, that a wife's submission to her husband is going to have some influence upon him? Isn't this just... Uh, old-fashioned and we can't take this seriously? Oh no, Peter's very serious about this. He answers this question with a resounding yes, do it this way. This is the way it worked for holy women who lived in the Old Testament. Remember the theme of 1 Peter is be holy because God is holy. So he's going to give us an example of holy women in the Old Testament of how this worked and it will work for you as a wife to, to be this way towards your husband, to submit to him. Peter is saying, my revelation from God is accurate. Wives, you do this, you're going to be in the will of God. And, and it's going to work for you. How do you do it? Well, you trust in the Lord, if you look at that verse. After this manner, in the old times, holy women also who trusted in God. This takes trust in God to be able to do this. You have to look at your situation and think, well, this is pretty impossible, I think, but nothing is impossible with God. He can work in all kinds of different ways when you obey Him in faith. This is how the whole Christian experience works. We have to have a connection to the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be able to live correctly for Him in the world. Um, he gives many examples of this in the scripture. One of them is um, the example of the vine and the branches. We're the branches, he's the vine. Unless we're connected to him, we don't bear any good fruit. N nothing good comes out of it when we're disconnected from him. And our connection to him is by repentance and faith. We look to him for our sustenance. We look to him for our example. We look to him for our instruction. We look to him for our doctrine. Everything that comes to us from God comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how these holy women operated. They trusted in God. They believed what God would say. So, trust in God and live by faith. Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So here's God's righteousness. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. If you're justified by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, having a new birth, being a new creature on the inside, you're going to be doing that because you're justified by faith. You live by faith. Our lives are lived by faith. That's what these holy women did. That's what it takes for a wife to submit to her husband, especially to an unsaved husband who won't sit under the sound of the word. So, trusting in God, live by faith. Holy women did this. God looked with favor upon them. They adorned themselves on the inside by walking with God, willingly submitting to their husbands, calling him Lord, not, not on the outside, not, not their hair or their clothing or, or jewelry, but on the inside, the hidden man of the heart, the, the, the one that is meek and, and, and quiet. That's what God expects. First Timothy 2, 9 and 10 says, in like manner also, this is the way Paul describes it to Timothy, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness. That means uh, with um, blushing toward men. In other words, you're not out to make a show to attract men to your, you or your body. And sobriety. In other words, you're thinking clearly about your situation. Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. It's not the outside that's important. But which becomes women professing godliness with good works. <laughs> It's, it's on the inside that counts, and it's the good works that you do on the outside that counts. Those are the things that please God. Those are the things that a godly man is going to be attracted to, and how you win a man who's not saved or not following after the Lord. Then in verse 6, he gives us an example from the Old Testament. The, the old time, after this manner, Holy women also did this. Now, here's the example. Verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. 
we can glean from the life of Sarah the example of godly submission to her husband, to Abraham. God considered her a holy woman who trusted in God and submitted to her husband. Sarah called Abraham Lord under trying circumstances. And we're going to look at this. It's in Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. The setting of this is when she is calling him her, her Lord is three heavenly beings have approached Abraham and they're headed to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed by them. And two of these are angels. One of them is a theophany, a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ there to Abraham. And Abraham is welcoming them. He's asking his wife to quickly fix food for them. They're, they're sitting down and having a conversation with them. And it's within this conversation that we get to be privy to Sarah's thoughts and how she looks at her husband and calls him Lord. So in Genesis 18, 9 through 15, and they said to him, the angel is speaking to Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. So he's talking about, this is the Lord Jesus speaking. We'll see that in just a second. And he's talking about Sarah having a child. And lo, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door. What's she doing? Well, she's making food, and she's inside the tent, but she's also eavesdropping on what's going on. She hears what's going on. She hears what the angel is, or the Lord Jesus is saying to her husband. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. You know what that means. She's not capable of having children anymore. Wherefore, Sarah laughed within herself. We are privy to, because of Peter's revelation from God, what's going on in Sarah's mind. She's hearing the Lord Jesus in a pre-incarnate form telling her husband that he is going to come and she is going to get pregnant and she's thinking, I'm too old, he's too old, this is not going to happen. She's laughing at that. She laughed within herself saying, am I, after I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure? And then here she says, what her thoughts about her husband, my Lord also being old. So she calls him her Lord in this circumstance. Then verse 13, this is how we know it's the Lord Jesus. And the Lord said to Abraham, wherefore, why did Sarah laugh saying, I sh saying, I shall of a surety bear a child which am old. In other words, Sarah's doubting. Sarah's laughing. He, he asked Abraham, she's laughing on the inside in the tent, eavesdropping. <laughs> the Lord Jesus knows what's going on inside there, inside her mind. And he asked Abraham, why is she laughing? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Here's the Lord Jesus. Look at this. He says, nothing is too hard for me. <laughs> I could do this. This is easy. At the time appointed, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied and said, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. So we know the rest of the story. The Lord Jesus uh, leaves them and he returns probably to heaven. The two angels go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. It's, it's burnt to a crisp. Uh, fire and brimstone come down from heaven. Lot and his wife and the two daughters escape, having to be dragged out by the angels by their hands. Lot's wife looks back and gets turned into a pillar of salt. But that is the context in the promise of God when this godly woman called her husband Lord. Now, I'm not recommending that wives call their husbands Lord. Well, that would be kind of funny. But... This is the attitude that she had in her mind. You see, we were privy to her thoughts. Shall I, shall I have my, my Lord is old? Shall we have a child? Wife, this is the respect that your husband needs as a man. This is the respect 
This is the chaste conversation, the pure life that you're supposed to have as you have this attitude toward him. Wouldn't that be amazing if you could develop that attitude towards your husband? <laughs> you don't have to call him Lord, but you look at him that way. You respect him in that way. Submit that way to him and in faith and treat him like that. Give him the respect that his position as head of the family deserves. We see Sarah pick up everything and go with her husband. God comes to Abraham. He's dealing with Abraham. He's talking with Abraham. Abraham, leave. Go to a land. And Abraham says, come on, we're packing up. We're leaving. Sarah says, where, where are we going? You don't know. She goes with him. She, she is a submissive wife. The angels come. Lord Jesus comes. Make food right away. She does it. She has this correct attitude toward her husband of submission. And we're going to look at two instances of her submission to her husband, and we're going to see the circumstances of those uh, instances, and we're going to figure out how that applies to our lives today, and how women can, in a like way, have a correct attitude about submitting to their husbands. Whenever they went someplace new, Abraham had Sarah say that she was his sister. Now, this is partially true. Uh, she's his half-sister. They both share the same father, not the same mother. So he's married to his half-sister, and she is gorgeous. She's a beautiful woman. And Abraham fears for his life when he goes into a new place that they will look at her, and if they know that he's her husband, they will kill him so they can have her. So he's afraid of this. Not trusting in God very much. Not, not living by faith very much in this instance. But Sarah agrees to do this, that she will do it. So it's half truth, probably a lie. He did this in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king that was there. It's in Genesis 12, 12 and 13, and then 16 and 17. Genesis 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see you, uh, Abraham talking to Sarah, they shall say, now they're going down there because of a famine. They got, they got to survive, and there's no food where they live, and they've got to go down into Egypt, and he's worried. When they see you, they shall say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, and will save you alive. Say, I pray that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and my soul shall live because of you. Then verse 16 of Genesis 12, they do this, 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 this happens. Sarah gets taken from her husband and put into the harem of the Pharaoh. She's a beautiful woman. The princes of the Pharaoh see her. They point her out to the Pharaoh. She's taken in to become his concubine or his secondary kind of wife. Then verse 16 says, And he, that is Pharaoh, treated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Uh, the Pharaoh is just pouring out the blessings upon Abraham for his sister. But, verse 6, 17 says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So, here's the situation. This, this uh, is kind of a half-truth. She is his sister, but she's really his wife. He's afraid for his life. Say you're my sister. She does that. She gets taken away from him and put in Pharaoh's harem. Uh, Pharaoh is getting bombarded by God. He's getting uh, <laughs> plagued by God. Abraham is being blessed by God. Pharaoh's giving him all this kind of stuff. We're not going to read the whole story, but then what happens is Pharaoh catches on. This isn't your sister. This is your wife. Why did you do that? Abraham explains, I'm afraid you were going to kill me. So uh, Pharaoh sends him packing. Take everything that you've got, all the blessings that you've received, take your wife and leave. I don't want this plague upon me anymore. God blessed Abraham 
in spite of this half-truth, he blessed Sarah and kept her from being taken into Pharaoh's, uh, into, into be with Pharaoh. All this she submitted as a godly woman <laughs> to her husband. Do you see how God protected her? God was blessing Abraham and protecting his wife in the midst of this half-truth. Well, there's another example. It's in Genesis 20. We're going to read 1 through 3, 6 through 7, and then 14. It happens with a king called Abimelech. Abraham does the same thing. He says, she's my sister. She agrees with him. I'm his sister. Chapter 20 of Genesis, verse 1, And Abraham journeyed um, from there toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and, Sh Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gira. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gera, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. I love this part. God's going to talk to Abimelech. He's dreaming this. And he said to him, Behold, you're but a dead man. I'm going to kill you. You're dead. For the woman which you have taken, she is a man's wife. So, Abimelech has a conversation with God and says, I didn't know this. He told me she was his sister. I did this in my integrity. Then God says in verse 6, in a dream, Yes, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. There tells us something about God. He can withhold people from sinning against him. Therefore, I did not allow you to touch her. Also, we know this is before the law was ever given, that adultery was considered to be a sin even before the law came. Everybody knew you don't take somebody else's wife, even these Gentiles. For I also withheld you from sinning against me, therefore I did not allow you to touch her. Now, therefore, restore to the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for you that you shall live, and, and if you restore her not, know that you shall surely die and all that are yours. So Abimelech tells everybody in his entourage, this is what's happened. This is what God said to me. Not only am I going to die, but everybody with me is going to die. So they quickly get rid of Abraham. <laughs> and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. Now, there's many things we could talk about in this story, you know, how God is blessing Abraham in spite of this deception. The thing we want to note is Sarah submitted to her husband, and she submitted under, under bad circumstances. I don't think any husband today is going to say, you know, tell somebody because he's afraid this is my sister. Women you see what God did here. He protected her. God didn't allow Abimelech to touch her. Pharaoh didn't get to touch her. She was obedient to her husband and, and God saw it through. It, God stood behind it. God made it work. It happened according to God's purpose and plan. Even though Abraham was kind of a bonehead. He kind of I mean, well, what's he thinking? Where's his faith in God? Why is he doing this? And yet, God protects his wife as she is a holy woman. She lives in faith and she submits to her Lord, Abraham. And God works this thing out for her. So Sarah was taken by kings into their harem, obeyed her Lord, her husband, Abraham, and they did nothing to her. God promised to make her the mother of, the, of nations and of kings in Genesis 17, 15 through 16. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be princess. And I will bless her and give you a son also of her. And I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations kings of people shall be of her. This is God's purpose. So in a flawed people, 
which we all are, God can use our circumstances and the trying things that happen to us for his purposes. Abraham got blessed. He didn't deserve that. Sarah got protected in spite of Abraham's bad moves. The Bible tells us about Sarah that she lived by faith. Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11. Through faith, Sarah also received strength to conceive seed. You know, she laughed the first time she heard that, but she began to believe it. She believed the Lord. Bible says so. She did this by faith, and she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She had faith in God and that he would bring about his promise to her, and that happened. Genesis 21, 1 and 2, And the Lord visited Sarah as he'd said, it was his promise, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God has spoken to him. This is exactly what God said would happen. And all the while, God is protecting her because she's submitting to her husband. So what do we learn from this? I mean, if the example that, that Peter would give in the Bible is of the, the husband that makes the exact right decisions, perfect decisions, we can say, yeah, he made perfect decisions. You should submit to him, wife. But that's not what happened here. These were imperfect decisions. This was operating out of fear for one's own life. And telling his wife to do something that he shouldn't tell her to do. Pretend like you're my sister. <laughs> and you're going to, I mean, does, doesn't he know what's going to happen to her because of her beauty? She's going to be <laughs> swept up and taken into the king's harem. But he's more concerned about his own skin. I mean, I don't think any husband's going to tell his wife to do that today. Your husband's probably going to make mistakes. God stands behind this. That's what Peter is saying. Obey your husband. Submit to your husband. Do it with a good attitude. Do it when he says to do it, and, and don't fight him over it. Don't make a big deal out of it. Unless he's telling you to sin against God and God's word, which will be very plain, do it. Knowing that God stands behind it. God will make it work. They didn't touch Sarah. She was withheld from them. And God came to her, made her a, a, the mother of nations and of kings, and she operated by faith. So that's what it's talking about. And it says at the end of that verse, don't be afraid with any amazement. Literally, the idea is do well and are not afraid with any amazement of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. It literally, it's saying, not fearing any fear, no, no fear, no trepidation. Listen, God will make this thing work for you, just like he made it work for Sarah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, how do husbands honor their wives? Verse 7 says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The likewise of verse 7 also refers to the likewise of verse chapter 3, verse 1, and it refers back to chapter 2 and what, ha what is happening there. When God gives instructions through Peter to servants about their masters, and the instructions are, uh, if you have a master that is not the bit nicest person, you're to submit to them anyway and suffer for what you do that is right. That's acceptable to God. So the likewise in this in these two instances in First Peter chapter three, refer back to chapter two, and, and their meaning, they have the same meaning. In other words, when you have a conscience toward God, you're able to suffer for what you do that is right, knowing that God will take this thing and work it out for your good. You do it with a conscience toward God. You know that this is acceptable to God, chapter 2 says, and that this is our calling from God. He calls us to do this. This isn't any mistake. God allows this thing to happen to us. And we're to follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus. And it gives how he handled uh, 
when he was mistreated and suffered and how he uh, didn't uh, rail back at people and he didn't uh, go back at them and, and go and get them. Now you would think that with a husband and his wife, if the wife was submissive to him, that he'd have it made. You know, everything would be hunky-dory. But that's not the case. It happens, it so happens that there's going to be suffering on the part of a husband for the things that he does that are right as he is loving his wife and working with her and, and being a good husband for her. It's very costly to lead correctly. In other words, you can do the right thing and there will be grief and suffering associated with it. And it will be wrongful grief and suffering. And you have to learn to take it patiently, likewise, just like the wife did and the, the, the servant did, with a conscience toward God, understanding that God allows this and God uh, puts this thing into your life. And we're following in the steps of the Lord Jesus when we do that. So that's what that likewise has to do with in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, right at the beginning. Plus, the husband has a responsibility to dwell with his wife in accordance with knowledge. So you can't be, or you shouldn't be, a stupid husband about living with your wife. You got to know what you're doing, is what the Bible is saying here. Now, I'm going to give you five things that it talks about here. One, you have to know what your duties are in accordance with the scripture, in accordance with what God requires. We have the responsibility to make provision, provide for our families, for our wives. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith, and he's worse than an infidel. So, husbands, you have the responsibility. Go out, get a job, provide for your family. Make sure you're taking care of them. Make provision for them. And husbands are to live, love their wives without bitterness. Colossians 3.19, it says, Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter against them. Making provision, providing for them, loving her without bitterness toward her. That's the attitude of the love that you have toward her. And then there's self-sacrifice, sanctifying your wife, loving your wife as your own body. Ephesians 5. 25 through 29 says, Husbands, this is Paul's uh, expanded version of what Peter is talking about. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, who could possibly do this? Christ loves the church and he gave himself for it. Well, husbands are never going to be able to accomplish this completely and perfectly. This is the direction we go in our lives. This is what we aim for. We're going to be Christ-like in our love toward our wives. It's a direction that we have. It's not a perfection. You're never going to get there, but that's the direction you're aiming for. It says, Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. So the husband's love for his wife is to be self-sacrificial. That, verse 26 of Ephesians 5, he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Husband, you have a responsibility. Is your wife being sanctified by God's word? Is she in the word? Is she going to church? Is the word washing over her to cleanse her? Just like it should be doing for you to wash over you and cleanse you. That's a husband's responsibility. Wives, submit to your husband's <laughs> Good attitude, do what they say, right time. Husbands, look at what he has to do. He has to love like Christ. He has to provide for his wife. He has to love without bitterness. He has to give himself up for his wife. He has the responsibility that makes sure that she's cleansed with the washing of the water. Verse 27 says of Ephesians 5, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So, Christ looks at his church and he works on it. He is presenting it to himself. He is, he is observing his church and he's whittling away at it. He's sanding down the rough parts. He's sanctifying his church. Husbands, that's your responsibility towards your wife. Where are the rough parts? Where are the parts that need to be sanctified? Or is she being set apart to God? That's your responsibility to do that. This is what Ephesians is saying here. For uh, verse 28, for men 
uh, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. So we take care of our own bodies, men, don't we? We're, uh, we want to make sure we have pleasure. We want to make sure we have provision. We want to make sure we have comfort. Do that same thing for your wife. Provide those things for her. Love her like you love your own body. Then in verse 29, For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. So it's our job, husbands of wives, to nourish and cherish our wives. So this is a big responsibility. The, the husband has, I know in Peter we have um, six verses about the wife and only one about the husband, but the husband's responsibility is explained uh, by Paul in other places more carefully. The husband's responsibility is much bigger for his wife. She has to be submissive to him. He has all these other things that he has to do for her. 1 Corinthians 14.35 says, and he, and if they will learn anything, that is, the wife is, um, wants to learn about the Lord, has questions uh, about the scripture. It says, if they will learn anything, last at, let them ask their husbands at home. So, uh, husbands, you have to be smart in the scripture. You have to know what the Bible says. You have to be a student of the word of God. She can ask you her questions, and you have to be able to answer them. So if you don't have that background, start to get it. And when there's a question, find out from some other man what the answer is and come back and tell her what the answer is. Begin to be, begin to be uh, the head in that responsibility. So those are some of the duties that the husband has. Provision, love without bitterness, self-sacrifice, sanctifying his wife, loving as your own body. Then number two, what our verse says, in 1 Peter chapter 3 is dwell with them according to knowledge. You have to know your wife. So you have to make a study of her. Study her. Where is she weak? Where is she strong? Where can you help her grow? What are the pitfalls should, that she should ab avoid? What relationships should she be in? What relationships should she not be in? What does she like? What does she dislike? You're responsible to put her in a place so she can spiritually flourish. Ephesians 5, 27, we already read that. It says that he might present it to himself, that is the church, a glorious church, no spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the way you want to be working on your wife, working with her, that she should be holy, without spot or wrinkle. So that's number two. Number three, give honor to your wife, as unto the weaker vessel. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7. Honor means esteem and dignity. Christ, Christianity uh, elevates women. Women are elevated. Uh, uh, some other religions do not do this for women. Uh, they make them wear a certain kind of clothing and they cover their whole bodies with it and maybe they have a little place they can peek out out of their eyes or they can't drive a car or they can't get an education. You know, they, 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 they marry, marry them off early. They basically buy themselves a, a child bride. These kind of things have been banished by Christianity. Women are uplifted by Christianity. Just the opposite of those things. Honor your wife as a weaker vessel. So uh, we, we know this word vessel means your body or, or, or your being. Uh, Paul uses it in Acts 9.15. Uh, Paul was a chosen vessel. Uh, Romans 9.22, there were vessels of wrath, so this talking about people. Her, her body is probably weaker than yours, unless there's something strange going on. And they need help physically, help with heavy lifting of loads. So you honor your wife, and you pick up those things, and you carry those things for her. You recognize that she is weaker than you, and you help her whenever you can. That's giving honor to your wife as into a weaker vessel. That's number three. Number four is honor your wife by recognizing that both of you are heirs together of the grace of life. She has an equal standing in her salvation, just like you do before God. You're no more saved than she is. God has loved her and sent his son to die for her. And she has confessed faith in him and repented of her sins. She's born again. 
You ha she has equal standing with you. They're equal in their sa salvation. Same life-giving Holy Spirit within them. Galatians 3, 26 and 28 says it like this. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. So we have... Uh, we are complementary in, in our relationships. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Uh, those roles are not equal. But in the salvation things, they, we are equal. There's not a Jew, Gentile, bond or free, uh, male or female. The, all those barriers are broken down in Christ. We all have that same salvation, equally loved by God, purchased by the same gracious act of the Holy Holy Spirit and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Every promise in Scripture applies equally to both to, to man and wife. And we have an equal hope of heaven. Then the last thing, number five, is honor your wife so your prayers won't be hindered. Now the commentators uh, have a little different take on this than I understood it all before this. And I think they're, they're, they're probably right. Is If you're having devotionals with your wife, if you're uh, not honoring her and you're having a fight, you know, you're having trouble and you're having conflict, you're not going to be able to pray too well with her. Um, plus, in your own personal devotions and your own personal prayers, those things are be hindered. So bickering and contentions and strifes, they're going to mess up your prayers, both individually and in and, and your relationship to each other. It makes it hard to pray. Uh, but prayer is a joy when you're walking with the Lord together in his gospel and it's being lived out in your relationship so husbands it's going to cost you to lead correctly likewise just like it's talking about in chapter two and in chapter three about the wife likewise it's going to be costly for you there's going to be things that you're going to have to suffer in order to be able to do this suffer willfully for what you do that's right live your lives with your wife according to knowledge about your duties toward her. Provision, love, sacrifice, sanctification. Know her in particular, who she is and what her needs are. Honor her in a physical way, as a weaker vessel. Uh, honor her as heirs together, as the grace of life. And honor her so your prayers aren't hindered. So, the upshot of the thing is, men, be holy like God is holy. And treat your wives like this. Cherish them and love them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've loved us and given us an equal standing with each other, men and women, in your kingdom together, that we, are, we each share in the salvation that the Lord Jesus has provided for us. Thank you for the distinctions that you make in marriage, submission of the wife and um, headship of the husband and his love for her and his responsibilities and his duties. Lord, we, have, we ask for each wife and each husband who's heard this, that they might be able to carry it through in their lives. Lord, there will be stumbling. There will be one step forward and two steps back and vice versa. Lord, help us. Help us to be your people. Help us to be godly. Help us to be holy like you're holy. Lord, we thank you for the power that you've given us in your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who enables us, who gives us the Holy Spirit and who has made provision for us and prays for us even now at your right hand. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, lesson 19, we're going to start with 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study his word. If you have questions or comments about this lesson, you can email me at all one word, Bible study, v by v at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse. Mm -hmm.